congratulations on this wonderful film and thank you for being our guest here tonight uh, and being willing to talk about it a little bit more with all of us. I'm going to just start with a few questions of my own, but please be thinking of what you might want to ask uh, Ilker while he's here as our guest, and I'll come to you uh, momentarily to um, take your questions as well. Um, but I'd like to sort of go back to the introduction because I feel like you were already kind of going where I, I wanted to ask, partially where I wanted to ask, but you mentioned that um, your co-screenwriter, Johannes, and that you were actually classmates. Um, and you alluded to something maybe from your own experience in school. Um, first of all, how old are we talking when you were in school together? We graduated from high school when we were 17, 17, uh, and we, we spent five years together in high school. So um, from 12 to 17, approximately, we went to the, we, was, we were in the same class, but it wasn't until the, uh, the last two years that where we got really close and we, we only got closed that, um, because of films, actually. So he had, he had a DVD player, which back in the day was a huge thing. And, um, and we connected over, over films. And he would like, invite me to his place, and we would watch movies. And I remember um, we, we all came back from summer, and it was the first day of class. And, um, I remember the teacher asking us what were the most profound, what, what was the most profound experience during, during summer. And he would ask and everybody would say, yeah, well, somebody would say, I fell in love or, you know, I, uh, my parents separated or whatever. But this nerd said, I watched a film. <laughs> and I'm like, what, well, what is going on? And it turns out that film was 2001. And then later he showed it to me and I got it. Oh, right, I understand. So yeah, we went to school together and then, um, and after, after school we, um, we started out making short films, Johannes and I, and then our ways kind of separated. He went to Cologne, I was in Berlin, but we stayed in touch and we're still very good friends. And a couple of years before this, we went on a vacation together. And he told me about this story that his, his, his sister experienced in her school. Her, his sister is a math teacher. Mm. And they had a similar incident. And then I remembered something that we actually experienced in our school time, which was like we got frisked, just like in the movie. Mm -hmm. Because that, there were like these two boys in our class who were stealing and everybody knew it, but nobody wanted to be that snitch. But it somehow somebody, you know, reported them. And then these teachers came into the class. And while we were talking about this, it was like, why didn't we, why didn't we, like, how would they do that? You know, they, they just did it and nobody questioned it. And, be, and that was because we weren't aware of our rights, you know, as kids. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, they, they also didn't say it's, it's voluntarily, you know, it was just, they just said, do it, put them, put them on, the, on the table and come to the front. And, and so we talked about this and that was kind of the kickoff for this story. Okay, that just answered my next two and a half questions. No, not, not entirely. A little bit, though. But, okay, so there were these stories, somewhat th memories, as well as more recent stories r related. Right, yeah. And, and I, I mean, what, what happens when you start out writing a script like that, it's, of course, there's one incident, and you take that as a kickoff, but thinking about it and then, you know, creating those characters... Of course, many, many, many more other things that you experience in life or have been experiencing in that particular society that also take their place, right. you know. And um, especially, like, I think the decision to make this only in school on, and not leave the school was the breakthrough kind of mm. move in the whole process. But yeah, I can el elaborate on that later maybe. Well, okay, because I was about to ask to, to what extent, basically, you, you just said that you decided to keep it in school, but at what point were you starting to think about society in a larger way outside of school, but this may be being very serviceable allegorically? Right. So in the beginning, like our first draft, it wasn't just in school. It was like also she, she had a private life and all. But... um. um 
at, at some point we said, okay, let's try and really make this work in school. And that had different reasons. One of the reasons was that I, 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 I didn't want to move with the set. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to lose time. I wanted to have time with my actors. And then, and then we, you know, we saw this French film um, called Entre les Murs, which was like, also, which also just takes in school. And then we tried to make this work in school. And the moment we took that decision, it was, it was just very apparent that, you know, school as it is, is always also a kind of miniature of our society because you have the same structures as, as you know, as states. Yeah. And when we went on to the whole research, which was another, you know, pro like another, how do you say, level of, you know, going deeper, mm -hmm. um, you actually, you can actually see how every school has their own agenda, has their own politics, and it's kind of like every school is like a, a little mini country, you know. And um, so we were very much aware of, you know, the, the the fact that we are basically we by making a film that only takes in school, you're also making a film about your society. Yeah, it comes through, I think, wonderfully with what what you did here. So. Um, Miss Novak, as played by Leone Benish, is a, just a tremendous performance in, in carrying the story. But really, the entire cast, uh, it works as an ensemble. Uh, the various teachers, but I specifically want to talk about the students. Yeah. Uh, they're just tremendous. Could you just share a little bit about how you go about finding young actors who can take on the role and, and how you worked with them to get what you needed for the film? Yeah. That was a very, very special experience because, you know, 23 kids like that, all of them very hungry to understand, to, you know, to, to, to experience, to make something. That was a very, very interesting process. Like, we, we started casting this, this, this class by gathering groups of four to six. And in those, like, I would be their teacher and they would have to convince me why they want to go to the demonstration on Friday and skip school like Fridays for Future kind of environmental um, demonstration. That was like the, 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 I said to them, you need to convince me. Mm -hmm. And in those improv sessions, I would very quickly see what kid you can work with. And, mm -hmm. and those kids I would gather again and then um, also have my DP and the camera, the actual camera, not just the little camera, the actual camera, the, the Alexa. Because we, uh, we, we, we needed to know how much, like how they act in, in the presence of a camera. Mm -hmm. So we would um, have that second stage. And then in the, in the third stage, I would have personal interviews with each and every one of them. And I would tell them, OK, listen, we are a family. We take care of each other. We're brothers and sisters. And if, we, if one of the kids doesn't feel well, we all take care of it. Second thing, I'm not your boss, you're not the kid, we're colleagues, and I want you to have a certain work ethic. Like, I want you to go sleep early, I want you to know what's happening in that scene, I, know, I want you to be professional, kind of, you know? And the third thing would be, there are no extras, because, you know, of course, the screenplay doesn't have 23 children talking. And some parents would come up to me and say, hey, why isn't my kid talking? Like, <laughs> and I would say, no, your kid can actually be talking. It's, 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 in, you know, it's, not ab it's about everybody can get involved. So that, those were the three questions. No, the, the three things I would tell them in those personal interviews. And when we then started shooting the film, every day I would talk, like I would start the day with a, with a, you know, with a conversation. And... I'd ask them things such as, what are your, what are your um, fears in life? How is your relationship to your parents? How hard is it for you to apologize? So I would really talk to them as if I would be talking to, to adults. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember this one, one particular moment where I, where I asked them, what do you want to become when you're old? And of course, all of them want to be actors. <laughs> and I say, OK, wh why do you want to be actors? And they go like, uh, yeah, because we want to make money, because we want to be famous, because we want to buy an island, literally. <laughs> One of them said, I want to have an island. And I thought that was so money driven, you know, and it kind of bugged me and also bumped me out. And I was like, guys, no, no, just a sec, wait. And, 
you know, when you work with kids, you have pressure, you have time pressure, you can't just... But I was like, no, like I, I need to work against that pressure just as if you, like when you feel tired, you, knowing you, it's, it won't help to lie down, you need to go to a run. That's kind of like the mindset I had, like I needed to take out the pressure by really talking to them. And I was like, no guys, wait, wait, why? why? What are we doing here, right? And they would be, uh, we're shooting a film. No, what are we doing? Um, we're trying to have fun. No, what are we doing? And I would repeat this question all the time so that they feel challenged, right? And then I would turn to Leonie because she would be standing next to me. And by the way, my DP is on the camera and she's shooting their reactions while, while we have these conversations, which, which we used later. And I would turn to Leonie and Leonie is like the smartest person in the world. She would immediately understood what I was getting at. She said, we're neglecting our families. I said, exactly. We're bringing a sacrifice and we're putting ourselves to the service of art. And I want you to understand that one day we're all be, we, we'll all die. You're all gonna be dead. But this movie is gonna be around and maybe your children will watch it and maybe your gra grandchildren will watch it. And I want you to be aware that this is more than just making money. You know, this is more than that. It's, and maybe, and we don't even make that much money. It's not about money. So it was very, and I learned a lot from them and I gave them as much as I could. So it was a very, very unique experience. It sounds like it, it sounds intense. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I didn't treat them as, as, as kids. Like they were colleagues, honestly. Yeah. Well, it's, the results are on screen. It's, it's, it's a fantastic vision. Thank you. Um, I want to ask one more question and then bring in some questions from the audience. You premiered the film uh, back in February at the Berlin Film Festival, and you have since shown it in a variety of other film festivals in other countries. Anything to say in terms of how the film, uh, what the reaction is from German audiences versus uh, international audiences that have seen it, and what sort of feedback you've gotten, if there have been any differences? Um, I can't... Like, I, I cannot generalize the international thing, but I can say that in the U.S., um, the, the, the audiences react much more physically. Like, I, I feel much more tension. I think, and that, I think it's got to do... No, no, let me ask it uh, in a different way. How many of you thought there was going to be gun violence? Mm -hmm. I did, and then I let it go. Good. I didn't think that was happening. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. So a couple of people raised their arms. I think that's the main difference. I mean, in, in Europe, um, it resonates with people, but I think in the States, like what I've heard so often now is that people were afraid that, it, that there is gonna be gun violence. And, um, um, and we, we, we briefly considered it, mm. but then we said, no, um, no, this is not, this is Europe. <laughs> and, and, um, and there has been a great film by Gus Van Sant called Elephant, who already um, had that. But um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that, that's, as far as I can tell, that's the main difference. Mm. So, so the question was how uh, Ilker went about using the music to both to create tension and then the sort of, not sort of, very triumphal ending finale. So um, yeah, like the music, just as um, any other head of department, so the, the composer got a restriction. So every head of department got restrictions. So we were like, the, the, what we did in the screenplay of not um, 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 leaving the school, we had in production design costume and camera saying, we want you to reduce everything like colors and, you know, aspect ratio and everything needs to, uh, we, we, and also I said that to the, uh, to the uh, composer, I said, I, you, I want you to use four instruments, classical instruments, and not more. And, um, and he would always try and vary the thing that is now very repetitive, you know, but um, I said, no, you, I want this to be like a neurosis, you know, I want this to be like a, a thing that, that gets into your head. And um, as for the, the, the final shot and that music, um, the final shot, well, 
Um, how do you say? So there is this novel called Bartleby the Scrivener um, by Herman Melville. Melville, or whatever, how do you, I don't know how to pronounce him correctly, but anyways, Melville wrote that novel, um, and it, it's about this guy who, um, who is a scrivener and at some point rejects taking orders from his, from his boss. And he would always go, I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to. Bartleby, don't you want to go home? I would prefer not to. Police comes in and needs, says, you need to go home now. I would prefer not to. He gets, um, how do you say, uh, uh, they, they take him out of the place put him in jail, Bartleby, don't you want to eat? I would prefer not to. And he would just, you know, go on until he dies. And I read this novel when I was like 20, 20 years ago, and didn't really understand the final, like, like I didn't understand the, the, what, what he was trying to say. But I remember the last sentence, which was, oh, Bartleby, oh, humanity. Mm. And that kind of stuck with me. And... When, when we were writing that, that f final scene, I kind of had to think of Bartleby, you know, and I had, I had to think of, you know, every, every person who, you know, every person, if we have a democracy, for instance, today, it's because there were people who were standing up against the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. There were people who were standing up, up against oppression. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had that kid um, on the shoulders, like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I, where, where, where we thought. And my producer, who is here today, um, <laughs> we actually had a bit going. He said, like, when we were shooting it, he said, okay, maybe, yeah, go, go ahead, shoot it, but you're not going to use it. Uh, like, <laughs> let's have a bet. And then when, when we showed him the, 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 uh, the, the final cut, no, no, the, the rough cut, he said, oh, it's great, you got to keep it. But I wasn't sure of, what, of it. So... And then, and then at some point we said, okay, maybe let's just not make this into a, you know, European art house film that ends on a silent tone, but let's just, you know, give the, the audience, uh, in German we say Rauschmeißer, so, um, which, is, which means, uh, does anybody know Rauschmeißer? Like, uh, uh, okay, uh, you can't nice. translate it. Like, it. It means something like, you know... A, a boom? A yeah, a boom, and you know, you can, you can go home with a, with a uplift. A, a Rauschmeiser. Rauschmeiser. Danke für der Rauschmeiser. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, it's a short question, but a long answer. Sorry. And are you a mu musician yourself? I, yeah, I, I, not okay. a professional, but hobby musician, yes. Okay, well, just the precision of, I give you four instruments, and you figure it out. But the, the score is wonderful. Uh, yes. Question is if the uh, the young the, the the student actors if they are professional or non professionals. No, none of them was professional, and um, I was actually very lucky with with Oscar because he's the son of Liebenwerder. So Liebenwerder, I first cast Liebenwerder, the um, the kind of antagonist in the in the faculty yes. of of, of Carla, and yeah. he he said to me, the actor, his name is Michael. Michael said to me. Listen, I got this kid, he's 11 years old, he wants to be an extra. I say, all right, another parent who wants to, you know, <laughs> so send him over. Uh, he sent me a couple of videos and I saw the videos and I was like, wow, this kid is kind of interesting. Send him to the casting. And then he came to the casting and I saw the kid and turned to the father and says, does he like meditate five times a day? What's up with this kid? Why is he so focused? And he was just a natural. And then I thought, okay, he has a kid that I'm gonna use as my Oscar. What about the other teacher? Maybe he's got a son too. <laughs> it turns out he has a son and that son is Tom. Tom is the son of Dudek. Oh, wow. So, um, so yeah, I was just very lucky that, and I knew that you know, if you have actors, parents, I know they are gonna prepare that kid for that shooting day, so I, I got lucky. That's terrific. Things have how things have changed for teachers and how hard it is right now for them to make to, to, to do their jobs. And this is something that I, I discovered in those research sessions that nowadays it's very hard to be a teacher. And 
because, you know, back in the day when I went to school, my parents would say, if the teacher says so, then that's it. That's it yeah. And now it's quite the opposite. Everything the teacher does is being challenged. And not just by the parents, but also by, you know, the, the children and the students. And the, the amount of multitasking that they have to deliver and the amount of work they can put, you know, it's just insane. And, you know, I grew, like, my the, the, the respect I have for anybody who picks up this profession today is immense because it's not an easy job and I would just encourage everybody to, to, to be empathetic with, with people who are doing that job. Yes, yep. yes, give it up for teachers, honestly. <laughs> honestly, they're doing such an incredible job and, and parents are just so hard to them. The other day I, I read this article that, you know, teachers, four teachers in, in Korea committed suicide because they couldn't take the pressure anymore. It's very hard and not just, you know, mid-school, also in universities, like it has shifted, as you're saying. They are not the people with power anymore. The people in power are the ones who can report them, you know, mm -hmm. and those are basically everybody else. Right, right. And it's captured, I think, in your wonderful film. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent questions. And once more, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody.